My name is Martin, and I'm in grade 12. That means I've been in the school system for at least 11 years. And that means that I have some experience with how the school system works. And um, so I've developed a pretty good consensus of what school is, and I think I've nailed it. School sucks. And, <laughs> and I don't know if that's what a lot of youth are thinking, I know that's what I think, I don't know about anyone else. I've heard people love it. But I'm just going to explain the reasons why I don't agree with some of these in the school system. The first is that a lot of knowledge in school is just about consumption and regurgitation. It's not much about, okay, cool, now that you know information, what can you do with it? Or some tools, just critical thinking about what you can do with that information. It's all about the consumption, regurgitation, that's what makes you a good student. But I think the analogy of a musician really makes this a lot better. For example, how does a musician learn his notes? Well, he learns them through consumption and regurgitation. But what makes a good musician? Well, it's a musician that can, yes, take that knowledge and apply it in a new creative way, which I think the school system does not focus on too much. The second is on how old our school system is. So the Canadian education system is based on a 100-year-old Prussian system that was developed during the Industrial Revolution. The reason why was because what was happening during the Industrial Revolution is new jobs were being created, and these factory schools were being made to, to give children the skills necessary for the new and upcoming jobs. And these jobs, of course, required manual, repetitive labor, and it was done in a dogmatic approach in order to make the students more obedient, and of course we can still see that in today's modern education system. One thing that school also does is it tries to avoid failure as much as possible, and I think that's in the way that tests are structured. What it is, is in a test, the less mistakes you make, and therefore the least amount of failure, the more success you have. But that's not really how life works. The more mistakes you have, the more you can learn from that and therefore go forwards, and that's called education. But the school system doesn't really force that. So, that is one of the big problems that youth have right now, is that the education system isn't too good. Or, actually, it is good in what it does. What it does is it creates obedient workers. But maybe we don't need that. And I'm going to go into the next problem that I see that youth have, which are called problems of despair. And there are three big problems of despair that the youth are facing right now. The first is loneliness. The second is loss of purpose. And the third is unemployment. And I'm going to go into each one of these specifically and how it affects the youth. The first is loneliness. For the first time ever, the, the youth are actually lonelier than the elderly population. It's never happened before. And loneliness does not just have mental effects on us, it actually has physical effects on our body. Loneliness is as much of a risk factor as smoking, obesity, and lack of exercise. But what more does loneliness bring? Loneliness is also the cause of two other crises in this country. The first is the opioid crisis. The opioid crisis in Canada is so bad that it's starting to lower the life expectancy here in this country. And which population is the fastest growing that is entering the hospitals due to opioid overdose? The youth population. And how does loneliness correlate to opioid use? Well, the part of the brain that releases oxytocin from social bonds is the same part of the brain that releases oxytocin from opioid use. So, when you are stripped from those social bonds, therefore when you are lonely, you are much more likely not only to start taking opiates, but also to get addicted to them as well. Then the second is we have a suicide epidemic. In Canada, the second leading cause of death amongst young adults is suicide, and that's right after car accidents. Between, for the last five years, the hospitalization rate of those entering hospitals from suicide risk from self-harm has increased by 65%. And how does this correlate to loneliness? Well, the University of Cambridge did a nationwide study with over 3.3 million participants over the course of seven years and it showed that loneliness and suicide have a direct positive correlation and that it's even worse for the youth. Next is loss of purpose. So here are just some headlines just showing why millennials and my generation, even more, Gen Z, need purpose in our jobs. And we're willing to give up pay in order to have purpose in our jobs. But uh, what if we don't have jobs? And that's the last one, which is unemployment. Canada's youth unemployment rate is two times higher than the national unemployment rate of adults. And of course in the US it's not much better. And in Spain there's more youth trying to find jobs than have jobs. But that doesn't mean that it's very well, it's very good here. There's two other things that are having, happening in Canada with the unemployment rate. The first is that we have a national, uh, the average student debt here in Canada is over $27,000. The second is that in the next 10 to 20 years, over 40% of jobs will be lost due to automation. So unemployment is really going to affect the youth even more with years coming up. So, we have three problems of despair. We have loneliness, then we have loss of purpose, and we have unemployment. So, we have two big problems that are facing youth right now. 
we have an edge, we have all these problems to be spared that are not only going to affect the youth a lot now, but even more in the future. But then we also have an education system that really isn't relevant in trying to help these problems. But what if there is a solution to both? And I think that this idea could help both. This idea is called Youth Focused Community Based Social Entrepreneurship. It's a very long words, so I'm just going to say social entrepreneurship for now. And, and, and this theory goes on the lines of if we were to get more youth involved in starting their own social companies, that means companies involved to, to try and solve a social problem, whether it be environmentalism or human rights, or anything along those lines, it would solve all the problems of the spirit that I previously mentioned. So let's start from loss of purpose. How can social entrepreneurship help loss of purpose? Well, the first is that when I speak to most millennials or people around my age, they all go, oh, I don't want to work 9 to 5. And it's not because those two numbers are like some demonic numbers or anything, but it's because they think that if they're going to go work for a boss, that they're not going to be able to do the things they want to do, and that they're just going to end up working for another company that's only purpose is to make more money. But in this case, with social entrepreneurship, you're able to have much more control over the things you do. And of course, there are external factors that compared to a normal job, you do have a lot more control on what impacts you can have. The second is that after about $75,000, you don't get much happier. So yes, wealth and happiness do correlate up into $75,000, and after about $120,000, it starts to dip down, actually. So what happens after $75,000? How can you get happier for $75,000? Well, it's through how impactful your job is. And in this case, if you have your own company, and you can have your own social entrepreneurship that is dedicated to an issue, you're able to not only, yes, of course, make money, because every generation likes that, but also you're able to have an impact later on. And I also believe that it would be better to have it locally or community-based just because it's a lot harder to help people abroad in the sense of with all the time and effort and money that you're putting in to try and help people that are on another continent or far away, well, it's much easier to help someone that's closer to you. Not only that, but the purpose that you gain from helping someone that's closer to you is just a lot greater just because it's so much closer in proximity that you're able to see the effects of what your work is happening. The second one is unemployment. So at the moment, 1 million Canadians are employing 8 million Canadians in the small business sector. That means under 100 employees. But over 55% of the small business sector in Canada is actually micro-business. That's under 4 employees. So actually a huge amount of our employment is coming from micro-business. That being said, I think that if we were to have the youth start off their own companies, it would not only allow them to have a job, but also create a new streamline, streamline of jobs as well. What it means is if I were to, for example, take a risk and start my own company, well, there's a new graduate that just came out of university. He's an accountant. If I were not to start my own company, or another couple of people were to start their own company, the only streamline he has for his talent and for his passions is just towards another big bank or another big company. But if we have a lot of youth social entrepreneurs dedicated to issues, it creates a new streamline for talent. That's not only good for society, but also good for those workers as well, which are of course also Gen Z, so they also want purpose as well. So unemployment would not only help those that want to take risk, but it also would help with those that are not maybe, are maybe not that much into risk taking. Then loneliness. So the thing is with loneliness is that a lot of the youth don't feel lonely because they're not in proximity, you're talk, talking to one another. They're talking quite a bit, but the problem is that they're not really connected with one each other. And why? Well, yes, we can blame social media, we can blame a lot, but this would be a solution to that. In the sense of, if you're working with someone on a common goal, if you're working with the same interests on fixing the same problem, well, it's a lot easier for you to get connected and you, for, for you to actually talk with the person and get with another person. So, lo so loneliness could be solved through social entrepreneurship by making people work together on a common goal with common interest. And um, I do think there's two things that need to be brought up, is that we do need to change, so first thing, we need to change the definition of what business is. Because if I say the word business, I think quite a few people here think Amazon or Google or these big huge companies that are just making money and that's all they do. Well, that's not what social entrepreneurship is about. If you really want to convince people to start going into business in small companies that are devoted to solving social issues, we need to change it from big and money making to small and problem solving because that's exactly what social entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship is all about. Then symptom solutions versus causation solutions. I read a report by Harvard and other couple that in the US they're starting to develop loneliness pills. That is of course to solve the problem of loneliness. But that is a symptom solution. And I think that social entrepreneurship or youth focused community based social entrepreneurship is a causation solution. It looks at why loneliness is happening and through risk taking and through entrepreneurship, it can actually solve loneliness and all other problems. So it's looking at what is the root issue that is happening and how can we solve it. 
So why are people starting on startups right now? Like, why is this not happening? Well, there's three big reasons. The first is risk. The second is they just don't know how, or, of course, money. But I think that there are three institutions that could solve each of these problems. And I think high school could solve the risk problem, universities could solve the know-how problem, and the government could solve the money problem. So, high school is fixing the risk problem. In the context of entrepreneurship, uh, we can't really do much. I mean, most of us are under 18, meaning we cannot sign legal documents, we do not have the funding necessary to start our own startups, and we don't even have a high school degree. So, how are we going to get anything done? So maybe this is the stage of life for us to start learning on why risk is good, and why risk is beneficial, and why risk is maybe even needed at this point in time. And I really want to bring up a key concept, which is failure is not called failure at this point in life. It's just called learning. What I mean by that is, for example, if my mom were to start her own company, and let's say it just fails. Well, she has two kids and a house to hold, right? She doesn't have... She, it's, it, she has a lot more at stake, so she cannot take down much risk. But what do I have? Or what do, what do, what do a lot of students have? Well, we don't really have that much risk. Of course, it's like family disappointment and stuff like that, but like, that's not the biggest thing at the moment. Failure at this point isn't failure. You don't just fail at this point. It's just learning. You fail, cool, you make a mistake, and you go forward and see what you can do with those failures. Failure is an educational basis. It's just learning at this point. So I think universities can fix the know-how problem with three methods. The first is having a different co-op program. The second is having more events and summits with small businesses. And the third would be to, um, to, to have better recruiting programs for small businesses. So the first is the co-op program. And I think that this could help this idea a lot. So the co-op program, so co-op is just like universities, students go off to businesses and they work there for a bit and the government subsidizes those workers in the company. Now I think, now from what I know, a lot of the call programs are for larger corporations. Not really that much for small business, but this could create a positive feedback in the sense of this. So a university student goes to a small company with the call program. So not only does the bet does the business benefit because they're getting subsidized work means cheaper labor, which for them is huge at the beginning of a startup, but that university student then gains the knowledge needed to start their own company. And the best way to learn how a startup works is to work in a startup. So during the course of their university years, they'll go off into different startups, learn how everything works, learn the structure, learn how everything evolves, so that when they come out of university, not only with the university knowledge that they know, but also with the knowledge of how startups work, it's much easier for them to go off and then start their own startup. And then what happens then? Well, he needs someone for a co-op, well then someone else from university comes in and works for them. And then that person goes off and then starts their own company. And that just keeps going, going, going in a positive feedback loop, which will create more entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship and create more jobs. The second idea I think of how the universities can fix the know-how problem is by just getting more social businesses into universities. This could be through events or some sort of summits so we can get small businesses into universities so the university students can say, hey, that's pretty cool. I want to go work for them. Oh, that's a cool idea. Now I'm going to start my own. And finally, there's a huge financial disadvantage between the large companies and the small corporations or the small, small social entrepreneurships, which is, of course, money. So the larger corporations and the larger banks and larger businesses, they have a lot more money to go to universities and recruit university students into their, uh, into their businesses. But smaller businesses just don't. So what we could, so what the university could do is give grants, give some sort of financial incentive for smaller businesses to come into the university and show that, hey, this is possible, or hey, come work for me, or hey, this is fine. Like, you can do this, it's not a problem. And finally, the money problem. I think the government could help the money problem in three ways. The first is by funding the co programs previously mentioned, by funding companies based on how many partners there are, and the third one would be by having a safety net for, for, for entrepreneurs. So of course, the co program, yes, the government would, could, could financially support that. The second is, if, okay, for example, if I were to start a company, um, the government would give me $1,000. But with this idea, what would happen is for each additional person, it wouldn't just be 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, well it'll be 1,000 for myself, then I go work with Joe, that's, then we get $4,000, then I go work with Maria, we have $10,000. So this would incentivize not people to work apart and compare, but actually for people to come together and share their ideas in a way that would not only help the community, but also the sense of togetherness. And of course, governments. The third thing that the government could help is with a social security net for first year entrepreneurs. Because the first year for entrepreneurs is the highest year, highest rate of success. Uh, no, highest rate of failure. 
first year is always the hardest. So what the government could do is have a safety net for the first year. So if you fail, you do have something to go on later. So if you fail, okay, fine, you have X amount of money that the government sponsors you so that you can go off and go again. It's not just, oh, I failed once, well, now I'm going to go back to the normal streamline. Well, no, you failed. The government gives you some sort of living mechanisms. So you go on and try again and again until it happens. I think the solution is a symbiosis. And I think it needs to happen from both parts. It needs to happen from the government, but also below. And here's the reasons why. So if it's just the government funneling a bunch of money, a bunch of money, but no one takes risk, well, the entire program fails, and that's it. But then, on the other hand, on the other hand, if there's a lot of students taking risk and they really want to go sell their own companies, but then there's no money, well, we're going to have a huge amount of people that are going to fail, and it all fails again. So I think it needs to be symbiosis. It needs to be the government working with the high schools and the universities to work together in order to create more entrepreneurship to solve these problems of despair. But I do think that it needs to start from the high schools because, I don't know about y'all, but it's really hard to change the government, but a high school wouldn't be easier. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's easier than changing the government. So, if you start from the high schools, it's smaller, it's easier, and this way we can see how it goes and we can test the waters. So what do we need in high schools for this idea to work? Well, we need a modern educational revolution. And revolution is a loaded word, I know, but it's not in this context. What I mean is, in the Industrial Revolution, when a lot of changes were happening, the school systems changed in order to give students the skills necessary and needed for the jobs that were going to happen in the future. Well, now we're in the midst of a new revolution. We're in the midst of two revolutions. We're in the midst of an automation revolution, and we're in the midst of the problems of despair revolution. And these problems aren't going to get better. They're going to get worse. So if we really want to solve these problems, we need an educational reform by giving students the skills necessary to get in order for them to have jobs later. And the first step is to take risk. Because failure is not failure at this point in life. It's just called learning. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk.